Hello everybody, today I'm going to be doing my presentation on narrative criticism. So before I begin, I'd just like to make a note that as I was doing my research and after doing my research, I realized that I use this methodology a lot more than I thought I did in interpreting scripture. And it probably has to do with my background and some literary, literary classes that I've taken that have affected the way that I read and interpret scripture which is not necessarily a bad thing, so as you will see, we're going to delve more into this topic and the pros and cons of using this type of methodology in interpreting scripture. Okay, let's begin. So um, to get started, I'm going to quote a couple of the uh, authors from the sources that I used. And James Rezegway says, To discover the artistry of New Testament narrative was like discovering a whole new world. And Kuhn, in his book, The Heart of Biblical Narrative, he mentions that biblical scholars have generally shown little interest in getting in touch with the affective dimension of biblical narrative. And so he refers to biblical narrative and this neglected dimension as the Bible's neglected heart. Okay, so the definition of literary criticism is that it focuses on stories in biblical literature and attempts to read these stories drawn from the secular field of modern literary criticism. That definition is from the Green Book with the chapter that's written by Mark Allen Powell. So it basically looks at how biblical literature works as literature in looking at the what of a text, the content, the how of a text, its rhetoric and structure, and it's analyzed and viewed as an organic whole. So some other important things to know is that narrative is to be read sequentially and completely with all parts being related to the work as a whole. So it's a very holistic view um, and interpretation of narrative in scripture. So narrative criticism also involves an implicit contract by which the reader has to agree and accept the dynamics of the story world that are that is being established by the author. Um, it demands that texts be interpreted from a faith perspective that their readers are assumed to hold. So this methodology is a very text-centered methodology of interpreting scripture, and it assumes that um, every component to what the author is writing, every component to the narrative, has intentionality. So um, we'll come back to two very important concepts of the implied reader and the implied author. That ha this has to do with narrative criticism. The historical development. So for centuries, the historical critical method dominated the movement, um, using books of the Bible as resources for historical reconstruction. So the need for a more literary approach to the Gospels was brought up by William Searsley in 1969, and he came um, with the assumption that biblical analysis should not should provide insight not only into the character of the communities that shaped the text, but also into the literary meaning and impact of the text themselves. So historical critical analysis focuses mostly on the world of the text and the communities to which the text was written. This focus on the original readers typically is what defined meaning of the text for the historical critic, as opposed to a narrative critic who, when they do their examination, can determine a, um, a range of meaning that may have a diverse application in a variety of contexts. So narrative critics are more open to poly polyvalence, which is a plurality of meaning, than historical critics are. However, it's important to note that the concept of the implied reader place, still places limits on the amount of um, meaning that can be construed from a text. So some key proponents that um, and contributors to this method include Robert Alter, who wrote The Art of Biblical Narrative. His goal was to illuminate the distinctive principles of the Bible's narrative art. Other contributors and the author of the chapter in Green's book, as well as the author of the, his own book called What is Narrative Criticism, is Mark Allen Powell, who uh, claimed that narrative criticism to be responsible, insightful, and sane, and reminded readers that much of scripture is, after all, narrative, marked by distinct poetic and rhetorical features. So other contributors to this method and key proponents include Adele Barilli, Mayor Sternberg, David Damrosh, and Shimon Bar Efrat. So they were also um, authors of resources that I used for this study. So, key components to um, narrative criticism include 
two concepts that are very important called the implied author and the implied reader. So the implied author is the perspective from which the work appears to have been written, a perspective that must be reconstructed by readers on the basis of what they find in the narrative. So regardless of the process through which a narrative comes into being, it will always have particular, particular values, beliefs, and perceptions that can be described as representatives of its implied author. So basically, you are supposed to understand the author by the way that they are writing and the values that they are that they are sharing in their narrative. Um, the other concept of the implied reader reader is one who actualizes the potential for meaning in a text and who responds to it in ways consistent with expectations that we may ascribe to its implied author. So it's presupposed by the narrative itself and it's distinct from any real historic reader. So narrative critics believe that attention to the literary cues enables them to determine the effects that a New Testament literature is expected to have on its implied readers. So these literary cues and components, literary devices that are used by literary critics include, oops, sorry include qualities um, that make them literature. So they're concerned with qualities of the narrative that make them literature, such as characters, the plot, conflict, ordering of events, causal links, rhetoric, imagery, setting, tone, and point of view. So um, just to elaborate on just a couple of these, causal links, they're interested in looking at the, um, the links between events that are related as explicit or implicit indications that one event causes another to happen. So conflict, what drives the plot, the development and the resolve, unresolved conflict leaves the reader having to figure it out themselves. So duration and frequency of events is also something that they look at, which um, includes whether um, if something is, is talked about for a long period of time or written about for a long period of time, there is a reason for it or there may be an emphasis that the implied author is, try to ha is trying to get the implied re reader to understand, as well as if the, an event is repeated multiple times. That also um, calls for an emphasis that the author is trying to convey. Another component that is um, pretty important for a literary critic is the ordering of events. So that is important because the readers are expected to consider each new episode in light of what happened before. So um, like I mentioned before, the text of a narrative is supposed to be considered as a sequential and as a complete whole. So every there is a reason for the ordering of events and examples may include flashbacks, allusions, or foreshadowing in, um, for what is still to come. So those are some um, literary devices that are used in studying um, a, narrative, a narrative in scripture. So we are going to do a case study application and this particular application will be centered on characterization and this study will be taken from Mark 5, 25 through, through 34, and it will be focused mostly on the marginalized overcoming their status. So here we have the lady with the issue of blood, and um, this woman, it's important to know, is a character within a frame that borders the text with another character at the center, which in this case would be the centurion, um, Jarius. And he is the main character. He is what who the story is about. So the woman ends up being known by her actions, by the words that she speaks, by what others are saying about her, and by Jesus' interpretation of her actions. Okay, so before we delve into this completely, there are a couple questions that I want to um, make mention of that have, to, that have to do with the marginalized in this society. So the character analysis of this woman prompts us to ask questions such as how do those at society's margins overcome their marginality? It also um, prompts us to ask what do they see that we should see and what do they do that is instructive for us? And what hinders those at the center of power and influence from seeing what the marginalized see? So with those questions in mind, a narrative critic would continue on in um, 
in describing that this woman interrupts the story of Jarius and pushes the ruler temporarily out of the margins. She ends up taking center stage. So this analysis would include looking at both both people who are afflicted, the woman who is sick with the issue of blood and Jarius' daughter who was sick and later was pronounced dead. So according to a, a literary criti critic would look at both characters as unclean, both the daughter and the woman, and in this um, case, both end up being called daughter by Jesus. One, both are dead, one is physically, and one is spiritually. And the daughter is reborn, and the woman is healed and restored to society. The differences between the two that are afflicted include that the woman touches Jesus and as opposed to Jesus touching the girl. And the girl in this story um, had to rely on a male character to intercede, whereas the woman takes the initiative. So she confronts Jesus secretly, um, which is indicative of her position in society, as opposed to Jarius' face-to-face confrontation which is indicative of his position in society. So while, yes, she is anonymous, it is her audacity that causes a reaction from Jesus, and her gain is essentially his loss. She is no longer, once she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, she is no longer um, considered anonymous. All attention is on her, and she is addressed as daughter, and her faith is what makes her well. So some traits of this of the character, the woman, is that she's unnamed, disease-ridden, unclean, but she is daring, fearful, and an exemplar of faith. So as you can see, her character is one that is developing. Also important to note is the repetition of the word touch, um, which underscores her bold action in crossing these boundaries. So it is her faith and her the her overcoming her marginality where she is re restored to wholeness physically, religiously, and socially. So that is one example of a way that you can look at a biblical narrative and use narrative criticism to um, unfold it, unfold the story. So the pros, oops, that's cons. The pros of narrative criticism are, um, they include that it provides the opportunity to study stories on their own terms. It's very text-centered, which means that it focuses on the text of scripture itself, yet it still demands a knowledge of the social and historical circumstances assumed by the narrative. It also provides, uh, Oops, I'm sorry. It also provides insights into biblical texts for which the historical background is uncertain, as well as, um, as well as providing for checks and balances on the traditional methods. It also tends to bring scholars and non-professional Bible readers closer together. Um, the cons include, and major objections include, treating the gospel as coherent narratives when they are actually collections of disparate material. Um, the major objection, the one that I had myself, is how is it that we can impose on ancient literature co concepts that um, come from the study of modern literature, which very well may have been very different um, and probably was, like, for example, rhetoric was a different concept now than it was back then. So it's important to find the balance on which devices to use to extract meaning from. Um, another objection was that it lacks objective criteria for the analysis of texts. So in closing, it's important that we use um, narrative criticism as supplementary material to other methodologies. It would be um, it would be really wrong to use only narrative criticism, but I think that the insights gained from it are worth its weight. I feel like we can learn a lot from studying characters. We can learn a lot from the setting, the tone of scripture. And I think it is suggested for both new Bible readers and those who have no historical background and educated scholars who are seeking to know more because there is power in storytelling. And I, I really believe that if you don't have that kind of background to study the word, using narrative criticism will allow for also um, a deeper understanding of scripture. So this is my bibliography.
and thank you very much.